Go ahead and open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. <clears throat> so, last week, as we were in Mark, we saw that uh, Jesus, Jesus asked his disciples in, in Mark chapter 8 last week, Who do men say that I am? And it's kind of a uh, pointed question when you think about it. If you could imagine being the disciples and being around the ministry of Jesus and, and seeing the miracles that he's done, and, and he just stops and says, by the way, I know everybody's talking. Who do, who do people say that I am? What are, what are they saying about me? And, of course, the disciples answer, and they say, well, some say you're John the Baptist, some Elias, and, and, or Elijah, you know, the, the New Testament name for Elijah. Some, some just a prophet. And you think about that. You think about Jesus asking them this question, who do people say that I am? And the truth of the matter is that this question has been asked of men of Jesus, or by men of Jesus, since the beginning of his ministry, since the beginning of his time on earth. Who is this man? Or who does he think he is? <laughs> As many times they would say. So when we think about Jesus, we think about this question that's asked so often, who is he? Is he just a, another teacher? Is he just another prophet? Is he the Messiah? Is he the Son of God? Is he God? Well, of course, we know that he is all of the above. But we have the completed Word of God. You see, the men of this day, they had no idea. They should have known even from their prophecy, from their scriptures, what little bit they had, they should have known who he was. And while we know who he is, we know that he's God in the flesh, we know that he's Savior of all mankind, we know that he is the Lord, the disciples are still trying to figure this out. And so here in Matthew chapter 17, Jesus, remember last week we talked about that transition in his ministry, things are about to change. So here in Matthew chapter 17, Jesus actually reveals his true form to Peter, James, and John. It's kind of an amazing moment here. And so Peter, James, and John, they actually get to see Jesus in this passage for who he really is. And yet they fail to understand what they see. They fail to see what's right before their eyes. And, and I fear that, that many times when Jesus is working in our lives, we fail to see that it's Him working or we fail to give Him credit for it. Because I think it's, it's difficult sometimes to recognize Jesus. So the question today is simple. Who is He? Who is He? And what do we see in this passage that will help us to determine who he is? First of all, I want you to see here in Matthew chapter 17, beginning in verse 1, we see some misplaced worship. Some misplaced worship. Now, trust me, this will, this will teach us who he is. Beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Now think about that for just a minute. I want you to, to back up, if you will, into Matthew chapter 16, and look at the last verse, verse 28. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and we looked at this last week. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see what? The Son of Man coming in his kingdom. There's a lot of controversy about that one verse. What does he mean by that? He hasn't set up his kingdom yet. He hasn't, he hasn't come in his, in his full capacity but when you look at that verse, and then it's followed by what takes place in Matthew chapter 17, Jesus takes them up into a mountain, and he's transfigured before them, and Peter, James, and John get to see Jesus in all his glory. It's fulfilling that, that last verse. 
Now, it can also mean that, you know, we think about Jesus Christ, and we think about his kingdom. What is his kingdom? Not necessarily his heavenly kingdom, not even necessarily his earthly kingdom, but the church. The church is his kingdom. We are part of his kingdom. So the church age is being set up, and Jesus is changing everything that people know to be true. He's changing worship. He's changing uh, the way people live for God. He's changing the, the face of the church. And so his kingdom has come because he's already set it up through the church. So you see how this is being fulfilled. He's allowing them to see his full glory, and he's setting up his church. So there's no confusion about this verse. He, he says in Matthew 16, some of you are going to see me come in my kingdom. You'll not taste death until you see my full glory. And then in Matthew chapter 17, he fulfills that promise. But as we look at this, Jesus in these verses actually peels back the veil of his humanity and he allows his glory to show. It says here, I, 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 and now follow me, verse 2, and was transfigured before them and his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as the light. Now think about how bright that would have been. Peter, James, and John are standing there, and Jesus is transfigured into a form that is as bright as the sun. Remember that. Now I want you to look at Luke chapter 9. Because Luke chapter 9 also discusses this. And we see here in Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse number 28... The Bible says in verse 28, And it came to pass about an eight day after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistening. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias. So in, in Luke, it actually says his countenance was altered. So the Jesus that they're walking with, the Jesus that they're serving with, the Jesus in the flesh that they see takes them up into a mountain and all of a sudden, as I said, he peels back the veil of his flesh and they see him for who and what he truly is. They see his glory, his entire countenance, everything about Jesus was changed, even his clothing. Imagine being a part of this. Imagine how amazing this would have been to see, to experience. And Peter and James and John are standing there. Now, now back in our text in Matthew 17, look what it says in verse 3. Verse 3, And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, or Elijah, talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. You see the misplaced worship? Now, even though they're, they're, they're watching this take place, even though they see Jesus in all of his glory, the minute they see Moses and Elijah, they're confused again. They don't understand what's going on. They're right in the midst of this amazing, miraculous event, and they don't understand what's going on. They can't see the truth that is right in front of them. They can't see Jesus for who he really is, and they decide we need to worship all three of them. It's misplaced worship. Well, we do the same thing, don't we? We have a tendency, if we're not careful, to put men on a pedestal. We tend to worship the man instead of God. We, we, you know, oftentimes we hear preachers preach and we think, oh man, he's a great man of God and boy, I would follow him anywhere and, and I, I could listen to him all day long. Anybody like that in your life? I mean, think about it. You know, we, have a, we are fortunate here to have a wonderful pastor. I love our pastor. I love his teaching. I love the, the study that he does and I'm so thankful for, for his knowledge that God has given him. But he is not God. And as much as I love coming to church here, as much as I love being a member of this church, as much as I love my pastor, I'm not here for him. I'm here so God can teach me, and God can use me, and God can touch my heart. Does that make sense? I mean, I'm here to worship God, not the pastor. 
but we often have pastor worship in churches a lot. I mean, truth of the matter is, and, and I know we have it here, regardless of what people say, if, if something happened to our pastor, God forbid, something would happen, and, and God took our pastor home or God moved our pastor to another church, you realize that our membership would probably split in half. Why? Because of misplaced worship. That's what's happening here. The tabernacle? It was a... So, you know, when they wandered in the wilderness, they had the portable tabernacle. So during that time of wandering, where they would move and they would travel like vagabonds, every time they'd move to a different location, they would set up this tabernacle where they would go to worship. So then, after they moved away from that and they built the actual temple, so the tabernacle was a, a, a Old Testament picture of the New Testament tabernacle, what they would do, or New te Temple, sorry. So what they would do is they had what they called the Feast of Tabernacles. And so every year they would have this celebration where they remembered the coming out of Egypt and the wandering in the wilderness, and they would set up these little booths, these little timber booths. They called them tabernacles. And so they would celebrate this festival of tabernacles. So it was a symbol of remembering what they were doing in the wilderness. So it was a place to worship, but just a, a smaller, kind of like an, an altar or something of that nature. But it just, you know, they're looking at, at Moses and Elijah, and I'm thinking, how do they even know who they are? I mean, how did they recognize them? Right. <laughs> well, is that picture in the Bible somewhere? I mean, how did they know? There had to be, a, obviously, a Holy Spirit presence that enabled them to see and to know what was going on, but yet they're still confused. Now think about that. We have the Holy Spirit living in our hearts. And oftentimes, when Jesus is working in our lives, we fail to recognize it because we're not understanding who He is. And so they, they see this glorious event, and, and actually in Mark chapter 9 talks about this. In Mark chapter 9 and verse 4, it says, And there appeared unto them Elias and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. For he wist not what to say, for they were sore afraid. So a little different view there because in Mark it tells us that they saw this and it scared them. Have you ever been scared by the way God works in your life? <laughs> you know, something happens and you go, whoa, what was that? What just happened? And you're just, I'm not talking about a, a, necessarily a fear of God's about to zap me, but wow, God just revealed himself. Have you ever been there? This is where they're at. They're just in awe. They're, they're, they're shocked. And in fact, there's another place that we'll look at later where they're actually on their faces because they, they... Think about it. The Bible's already told us that Jesus is shining as bright as the sun. Look at verse 5. Verse 5 of Matthew 17. While he yet spake, so Peter's talking to Jesus, do we build these tabernacles for you and Moses and Elijah? While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Now Jesus is already shining as bright as the sun. And this cloud comes in that overshadows them, and it's brighter. Now think about that. How much brighter could that be? I mean, if Jesus is as bright as the sun and there's a cloud behind him, it's not casting a shadow unless it's shining, right? So if it overshadows them, it's brighter than Jesus. And so it says, this cloud overshadowed them. Behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, notice, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. They, they, they realized there's something more going on here. This has to be God. And they weren't even going to look on God. They didn't even attempt it. The, their, their faces are on the ground. They didn't want to look up. They didn't want to, they didn't want to uh, you know, die, I guess, because of the, the glory of God that's already there. And, 
And so they're in fear and they're on their faces. Here's what we need to think about. Many times we feel like when I come to church, I'm in church, therefore I'm worshiping. I'm reading my Bible, therefore I'm worshiping. Or I'm praying, therefore I'm worshiping. I, I'm not, I'm, I don't believe that at this moment that Peter, James, and John are worshiping God. I think they're fearing for their lives. They don't understand what's taking place. They want to worship Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. But they don't understand what they're seeing. They don't understand what's taking place. Right. They were taught that. So, that's why I said they don't want to die. <laughs> they don't want to take the chance of looking up and being dead. So it's kind of a, a misplaced worship here. They're, they're, in, they're cowering in fear when they should be praising God for His presence. Now listen, I, and I say all this to say, you know, that when we come to church, worship is from the heart. It has nothing to do with the outward ceremonial things that we do. Through our heart, we understand who God is and what God is, and He is reverent, and we should reverence Him. And he is the creator of all, and we should be amazed to be in his presence. I'm not saying we should cower in fear, but we should understand who and what God is. Look, if you will, at verse 8, or verse 7, I'm sorry. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes and saw no man save Jesus only. So Jesus comes to them, he comforts them, he touches them, he says, you don't have to be afraid, and they look up and Jesus is there all by himself. What just happened? Where did everybody go? And he's back to his normal self, if you will. Now when you think about this, this misplaced worship, you and I, we need to see Jesus in his glory to understand how to fully worship Him in a way that honors Him. Jesus is not the big man upstairs. Boy, I hate that. I used to work with a guy years ago, and he used to say, me and the big man, we're like this. And that would just grate on my soul. That is so irreverent. It's bad as taking the name. Exactly. That's completely as bad as taking his name in vain. Because I'm not, I'm not acknowledging the glory of Jesus and the, and the worship that he truly deserves. His holiness. I mean, we, we can't get past that, folks. And we need to understand that when we come to worship, we should always worship in a fashion that honors him. And when we try to worship in a way that looks like the world, acts like the world, sounds like the world, and fits my agenda, that's not honoring God in worship. I'm sorry, it's just not. Because He deserves so much more. Moving on. Not only do we see misplaced worship and that He's worthy of true worship, we also see a misunderstood prophecy. Look, if you will, in verse 9. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man, until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then, notice this, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? We have a misunderstood prophecy here because the disciples had heard over the generations that the teachings, the traditional teachings in the, in the synagogue, the traditional teachings of the scribes that Elijah or Elias is going to come and be the forerunner of, of Jesus. And so they're saying, well, why do they say this? We just saw him. And now he's gone. They don't understand. They're, 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 they're shook. We just saw Elijah. If he's going to come before you, why did he go back? 
Why is everybody saying he's coming first? Well, where do they get this? This is actually a prophecy that comes out of the book of, of Malachi. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1, the Bible says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. So this is a prophecy of the messenger coming before Christ that was taught in the Old Testament and would have been taught through Jewish tradition. So then Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5 says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So there's some, some confusion. There's some misunderstanding about this prophecy and the disciples are trying to figure this out and they're trying to put the pieces together. And Boy, have you ever read scripture and you said, that, that doesn't make sense. That, that doesn't line up with what I've been taught. That, that sounds completely different to me. And then you have to go study and you have to go figure things out and you realize you've been wrong. Anybody else ever been there? There have been many things in my life that I thought were, were biblical only to find out that they had no backing in Scripture. Was well, we listen to men. They're listening to these traditions that have been passed down in Jewish tradition and in Jewish fables, if you will, and they're, they're confused. They, they misunderstand this, this prophecy. But Jesus explains it to them. Look at verse 11. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall come first and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is come already, and ye knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Notice this. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Did you see that? So it was prophesied in Malachi that Elijah would come and be the forerunner of Jesus. What they're not teaching here is that John the Baptist was a type of Elijah. He was often referred to as Elijah because they had, they had common mannerisms, they had common appearance, they had common uh, teachings. And so when, when John the Baptist was, was on the scene, he was so eccentric and so crazy, eating wild locust and honey and dressing in animal skins. And Well, who did that put them in mind of? Elijah. You see the comparison here. And so the, as Jesus is explaining this to them, they understand. He's not talking about Elijah. He's talking about a type. He's talking about a figure like Elijah who is John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, the messenger in the wilderness. What an amazing picture. But it takes Jesus sitting them down and, and getting their focus and saying, listen to what I'm saying. Understand. But in this entire incident, there was one thing that they did not want to address. I want you to look at verse 22. In verse 22, it says, And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceeding sorry. You say, now wait a minute, that doesn't take place on that mountain where he was transfigured. Well, in Luke chapter 9, in Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 30, this is the same incident, Jesus being transfigured on the mountain. It says, And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory. Wait a minute, they appeared where? In glory. So in Jesus' heavenly kingdom. This is, what they're, this is the picture that they're seeing. They're seeing Jesus and Moses and Elias in glory and spoke of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. So what was the conversation between Moses and Elijah on the mountain? They were talking about Jesus' death. 
the disciples didn't want to talk about it. They didn't want to hear that prophecy. They, they didn't want to mention that prophecy. They didn't even want to think about that prophecy because that's not going to happen. You remember Peter last week? Lord, that's not going to happen. Get thee behind me, Satan. They did not want to approach this subject. The last thing on their agenda was the death of Christ, and they did not want to hear that prophecy at all. So they were ignoring the subject, so much so that Jesus has to bring them back to it at the end of this chapter and say, listen, we got to talk about this. You have to be prepared because I have to die. And he's trying to get them to understand the purpose of his death. And how many times have you, have you read prophecy or read scripture and thought, I just, I just don't understand that. And as Joanne said, you know, oftentimes we listen to men and we miss the truth of Scripture because we just take what they said at face value. I mean, that's why I love about our pastor. You know, if it's his opinion, he'll tell you, this is my opinion, take it or leave it. But encourages us to do what? Study. Check it out for yourself. Read it for yourself. You know, many Christians today, and I, I find this strange, but many Christians today don't want to hear anything about end-time prophecy. You start talking about end-time prophecy, they'll walk away. No, oh no, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to think about that. I want to see my grandbabies grow up. I want to see my kids grow up. I want to see this. I want to do that. And I go, why? Yeah. <laughs> Please, come now, Lord. How about... Now, <laughs> yeah. and the truth of the matter is, I can understand on the human side where they're coming from, they don't want to think about, about life ending, but truth of the matter is, folks, all of prophecy has been fulfilled for us to be met up with Jesus in the air, for us to be caught up to meet him in the air. All the prophecy has been fulfilled for that to take place. We don't need anything else. And the truth of the matter is, we don't need to understand it. It's okay to study it and try to understand it. There's nothing wrong with that. But so many times people get so focused on that 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 becomes their life goal is to understand every jot and every tittle. And it's just not going to happen. I mean, we could be completely wrong because our finite minds can't understand it. But so many times we get caught up in trying to learn and trying to know and trying to understand that we misunderstand. We try to put things in there that aren't really there. And, and Jesus is trying to get these disciples to focus. He's saying, come on, man, let's get back to the truth of this. Let's get back to the purpose of what you saw on the mountain. They were preparing me for my death. You need to understand this. You need to remember this. You need to focus on the truth of what you saw. And that's what we need to do. We just need to focus on truth. Is it in Scripture? Is it backed up by Scripture? Can I go to the Bible and find that truth that he's teaching? Many times, <laughs> my wife and I have sat in churches and we're going, that's not right. What is that guy talking about? And I mean, you can go right to Scripture and say, it says right there. I mean, he's wrong. Have you ever been there? I mean, we need to know truth. And that's what Jesus is trying to get his disciples to understand. They misunderstood this prophecy of Elijah because they weren't willing to look at the whole picture. They weren't willing to look at everything that they saw that was right before their eyes. They saw Jesus in his glory. And they still misunderstood the purpose of that incident. What else do we see in our text? In Matthew chapter 17, not only do we see a, a misunderstood prophecy, we see mercy given. Now this is, this is kind of quick here in verse 14. In verses 14 through 16, the Bible says here, And when they were come to the multitude, they came to him, a certain man, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed. For oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples and they could not cure him. So, so we see this here 
that this father in desperation, he comes to Jesus and he's pleading with Jesus, please take care of my son, please help my son. He's possessed with this demon. He says, I've asked your disciples for help and, and they just can't seem to do anything. And he even goes so far as to specifically ask Jesus for mercy. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been so distraught and so, so confused or so broken that all you could do is cry out for mercy? You know, maybe you're praying and you're just you're crying and you're sweating and you're just pouring your heart out to God and, and you just don't even know what to say anymore. God, I just need mercy. That's where this man is at. <laughs> I've tried everything, Lord. Nothing's helping. Your disciples aren't even helping. I just need mercy. Look at verse 17. Then Jesus answered and said, Oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. Now, look, he's not saying this to the man who's asking for mercy. He's addressing the multitudes. How long do we have to deal with this? You faithless generation. So he's addressing his disciples. And so they bring the, bring the child to him in verse 18, and Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. So aren't you glad that not only do we have Jesus who has power over the demons, but he has authority over the demons? Because he just rebukes that demon, and he has no choice but to leave this child. He has to obey the Lord. Why? Because he's the one that created him. You know, think about that. This, this is really a truth that I think a lot of us have forgotten in our walk with the Lord. Even the demons that are trying to destroy us, even the demons that are against God and anti-Christ, even the demons have to obey Jesus. Why don't we? You ever wondered that? I mean, we know how wicked and vile and disgusting these demons are, but even they have to obey the voice of Christ. Or ask permission. Or ask permission. Knows this, but he right. Well, well, he's so full of pride, he thinks he's going to win anyway. You see, that's our problem. We're so full of pride, we think we know better. We think we know more than Jesus. I don't need him. I don't need his help. I can handle this one. No. You know what we need? Mercy. We need to be like this father every day and fall on our face before the Lord and say, Lord, please, give me mercy today. More than anything, I need your mercy. I need you to help me. I need you to guide me. Look at verse, 29, or verse 19. Sorry, Verse 19, Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said... <laughs> No, we're not going to talk about this in front of the crowd. Notice this. We want to talk to you privately, Lord. They get Jesus apart, and they say, why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall be removed, and nothing shall be impossible for you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. What an amazing truth here. Uh, because the disciples come to Jesus and they say, you know, we tried. Well, why couldn't we help this man? Why couldn't we help the boy? And Jesus said, because you lack faith. I, I love what John R. Rice says in his book, Asking and Receiving, or Prayer, Asking and Receiving. He says, all of our failures are prayer failures. Do you know why our prayers fail? Because we lack faith. That's exactly what Jesus said. Now, I'm thankful here that Jesus did not say you have to have great faith. He didn't even say you have to have strong faith, did he? He said, no, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed. You know, we know that the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds. I mean, it's so tiny, if you dropped it on this floor, you'd probably never find it again. It looked like a speck of dirt. That's how tiny a mustard seed is. And Jesus says, if you had that much faith, you could obtain the impossible. 
You see this? If you had that much faith, the grain of a mustard seed, if you had that little bit of faith, you could move mountains. Imagine what we could do if we had full faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Imagine what we could see. Imagine the answer to prayer. You ever wonder sometimes as you're praying for something and it feels like your prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling and God's not listening to you anymore? Why aren't you hearing me, Lord? Why aren't you answering my prayer? Check your faith meter. Have you, have you ever prayed like this? I know I have. <laughs> Lord, I need your help. I don't know what to do, but I'll figure it out if you don't. We may not say those words, but our actions say that, don't they? Lord, I need your help. I need you to pay this bill for me, but I'm going to go work some overtime on Sunday just in case. You know what that's saying to the Lord? I have no faith. And that's exactly what he's saying to the disciples. They said, why couldn't we help this boy? Why couldn't we cast out this demon? Why couldn't we do anything? And he said, you just don't have faith. Not enough. Yeah. Now, and then there's another story we might get to it sometime in the book of Acts. <laughs> and I love, it's one of my favorite stories, I think, in all the Bible when it comes to this type of situation. The, the sons of Sceva see the, the disciples casting out demons, and these sons of Sceva, who were, Sceva was a, a, a priest, and so they decide they're going to do the same thing and they're going to earn some money doing it. And so they go and they start to cast out demons or try to cast out demons. And they come into this one possessed man and they speak to the demon and say, In the name of Jesus Christ, we adjure thee, come out of him. And the demon says, Jesus we know. And Paul we know. But you? We don't know you. And the Bible says the demon leaped on them and beat them and, and tore, them, tore their clothes off and they ran out of the house naked. I love that story. I just, to me, that, that, is, that is the funniest story in all the Bible. I just think it's so cute. But, but the, the fact that they knew Jesus and they knew Paul speaks volumes of Paul, doesn't it? Yeah. But you see, we could have the same power if we just had faith. Because these men that walked with Jesus and saw His ministry on earth. They had no reason to doubt at all. They had no reason to question anything. They had every reason to trust everything that He said. Especially the three that were on the mountain with Him and saw Him in His glory. This is the Son of God! And they knew it. Because they were told by God, this is My beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. What's He saying? Do what he tells you to do. Listen to him. What an amazing story. Moving on, finally we see in verse 24, we see a miraculous provision. Miraculous provision. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? Now stop there for just a second. I want to explain this to you. These are... The temple tax collectors, these are not the Roman tax collectors. These are not the, the, the uh, my mind's drawn a blank. Yeah, Matthew, what was Matthew? Publican, publican, that, that's the word I was looking for, sorry. <laughs> my mind just went, whoop. They weren't publicans, these were, these were temple tax collectors. Because in the book of Exodus, Exodus 30, there was a law set down that all Jewish males must give, one, or give half a shekel to the temple every year. This was a temple tax. This is what's taking place here. So they come into Capernaum and these temple tax collectors stop them. And they say, hey, doesn't your master pay the, the tax? Doesn't your master pay tribute to the temple? Where's the money? You see this? This is, this is what's taking place. All right, verse 25. Verse 25, he saith, yes, and when he come into the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, what thinkest thou, Simon? So Simon said, well, yeah, of course he pays tribute. Of course he pays taxes. And Jesus kind of rebukes him here. He says, what thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? You see this? Are they taking taxes from their children? 
or from people outside the family. You see what he's asking him here? This is exactly what Jesus is saying. And Peter saith unto him, of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, then are the children free? So do the children have to pay the tax to their father? Well, the answer is no. You see what he's saying here? Verse 27. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend lest we should offend them, go to the sea and cast in a hook and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou openest his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. That take and give unto them for me and thee. So Jesus is telling him here, listen, this tax, this, this temple tribute, do you know who I am, Peter? When we pay this tribute, when we pay taxes, who do we, who do we pay? Who does, who does the king ask tribute of? His children or strangers? You see what he's asking here? And he says, well, strangers, of course. He doesn't ask the kids to pay tax to live in his house, right? This is the, the idea that Jesus is giving him here. And Jesus says, Peter, you know who I am. I'm the son of God. You just learned that on the mountain, remember? When my father said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Why... You, you're, you're speaking for me saying that, yes, I pay tribute. Why should I pay tribute? I'm in my father's house. You see what he's saying here? And Peter doesn't quite understand. And Jesus says, but we're not here to offend. So I want you to go fishing. And the first fish that you pull out, Peter, I want you to look in his mouth. And whatever is in his mouth, that is what you will give for tribute for me and for you. See what he's saying here? It may not be right. It may not be required of Jesus to pay this tribute because he is the Son of God. He's the one technically they're paying tribute to. You know, he's, he should be the one receiving tribute. But he's saying, we're not here to offend. We're not here to make enemies. We're not here to be offensive to others. So we're going to pay it. Just so that we can keep the peace. Do you see what he's saying here? Now, I, I, I'm not saying that you all, we all need to run out and start paying tribute. We all need to you know, make sure we're paying this or that. But you know, when we come to the house of God... What is required of us? Our tithe and our offerings. It's required. Now, truth of the matter is, that's how the church survives. That's how the church keeps the lights on. That's how the church pays the bills, is by its members paying tithes and offerings. Offerings go to special events, and, and offerings go to missionaries, and offerings go to building funds, and offering goes to all kinds of different things. But your tithe, I mean, those things, they belong to God. And Jesus is telling Peter here, I'm the Son of God. You know this. I'm not required to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Because it, 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 it's the right thing to do to keep the peace. I'm not saying that we should always be willing to compromise. I'm just saying sometimes we need to remember that in order to keep the peace, we need to do things that are right to do, not against Scripture, but things that maybe we wouldn't normally do. Now, I'm not saying you go sit down and have a drink with your buddies because that makes them feel better. You know, we know that's wrong. I'm just saying sometimes we need to keep the peace. And we look at this passage and we think about the question at the beginning. Who is he? And we think about all of the different incidents or different actions that we saw take place in this one chapter. Who is he? Well, he is Messiah. He is king. He's worthy of worship. They may have had misplaced worship. We shouldn't. He is the only one that is worthy of worship. He is Savior of the world. He's prophesied from the beginning of time. They, have, they may have misunderstood the prophecy, but we don't. And we need to continue to share that. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior. He is 
the giver of mercy whenever needed. <laughs> and boy, we need mercy, don't we? We need mercy all the time. I need mercy every day so he doesn't give me what I deserve. He is the provider of all that we need. And he provides in a miraculous way all the time. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Not, not our power, not our glory, not our riches, but his. He is the provider and he will provide all that we need. We need to know Jesus. We need to take the time to study His Word and get to know Him on a personal, private level. I hate to think of John and James and Peter on that mountain to see Jesus in all His glory and miss the message. Know me. Know who I am. Know that I am all that you need. Amen? Father, we thank you today for this time. We thank you for these lessons that we can learn about the Lord and about how you work in our hearts and our lives. And Lord, we just pray you'd help us to continue in these truths and apply them to our lives each and every day. Lord, be with the service to follow. Be with Pastor as he brings the message this morning. May it be exactly what we need for our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.